Welcome to Disciple Dojo. I wanted to share another children's resource that I've come across that is really, really good. I've reviewed a number of study Bibles for children or Bible storybooks for children, graphic novel Bibles. There's a lot of stuff out there for kids. The problem is most of it is done by people who don't always have the best grasp on the text of scripture theologically. Most of the time when you get a children's Bible story book, they, they fabulize the Bible stories to make them into little self-contained lessons for kids. You know, like who are the Goliaths that you face in your life, that kind of stuff. But I came across one by one of the best theological minds alive today. And so I wanted to point Dojo readers to it, especially those of you that have children or that work with children. So before we jump in, if you haven't already, go ahead, click the subscribe button. Enable the notifications when you do. That's a huge, huge way to help this channel grow. And for more reviews of different study Bibles or biblical resources here on the channel, take a look at the playlist. A lot of people don't realize they just kind of click on a video that YouTube puts up on their screen. But everything here on the channel is categorized in our playlists. So take a second if you've never done that. Hop on the playlist, look through all we have in the Bible reviews and stuff, in the Bible background series. We've got interviews. We've even got our superhero seminary videos. That's why I'm surrounded by all these guys on the shelves behind me. So take a look at what we have. Everything we do on this channel is entirely free. So if you appreciate this ministry uh, and you want to help us to continue to reach more people, continue to grow, continue to put out resources, then consider becoming a monthly dojo donor at, at whatever amount. We don't do tiered memberships here. We don't do super chats. We don't have Patreon, none of that stuff. We just say, if you appreciate what Disciple Dojo does, here's how you can support us. And then we just leave it up to the generosity of Dojo viewers. Okay, now that the housekeeping is out of the way, let's talk about God's Big Picture Bible Storybook by N.T. Wright. Now, if you don't know who N.T. Wright is, uh, you've been living under a rock, basically. Wright is one of the most prolific New Testament scholars ever. Honestly, like behind me, you can't really see it, but like right behind me on the shelf, most of those books are his volumes. He has written extensively for decades now. And even among people who don't agree with all of his conclusions, he is still widely considered one of the most respected and renowned New Testament scholars in the world. So what's he doing writing a children's storybook Bible? Well, in a video that he did before this was released about this project, he said that once he had grandkids, he started to realize how important it is to pass on the big picture of scripture, the full storyline, so that when his grandkids were reading or hearing or learning about biblical stories, they would have a context to put it all into. It wouldn't just be a string of random stories or little isolated fables with these Bible characters, but it would tell one unified meta narrative. And that's what he sought to do in the Big Picture Bible Storybook. He's taken 140 episodes from scripture and put them together along with illustrations by Helena Perez Garcia. And the goal is to, as you move through this, you get a big picture understanding of the Bible. You get the story that Jesus presents himself as the culmination or the fulfillment of. So let's take a look at some of what you'll find in here, and then I'll give my thoughts on it at the end. So this is hardback. It's about 288 pages or so. It's by Tommy Nelson Publishers. And so you open it up to the contents. Here are all the stories. Part one is the Old Testament stories. Part two is the New Testament stories. Then in the back, there are some maps. We'll look at those at the end. And there's an index so you can find the actual stories. So there's a brief overview introduction by N.T. Wright. And again, he is just one of the most prolific New Testament scholars of the 20th and early 21st century. So the stories, this is the format of each story. You have the illustration on the right, very colorful, very non-Caucasian. That's one of the things I really like about all of the illustrations. For instance, the men are Hebrew looking men, so they all have beards, something you don't see in a lot of Bible story books. They're all darker skinned, Middle Eastern looking, ancient Near East peoples. But then the style of the art is almost iconographic. 
it's very flat. It's very colorful. It reminds me kind of like a, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember flannel graphs or flannel board Bible story illustrations, but this kind of has the feel of one of those or old vacation Bible school literature, but it's very colorful. It's very engaging. It's pretty detailed, but you have the illustration on the right hand side. And then the story that N.T. Wright has adapted and retold on this page. And then at the top in each one, you have where it's found in the Bible. So in this case, John 2. And then at the bottom of most of the pages, not all of them, but most of them, you have what else in God's big story links up with this. And it'll tell you, turn to page whatever for a story that has to do with this. So most of them are linked, and some of them are linked to more than one story. But I really do like these illustrations. This is, if you ever saw, like my favorite Jesus movie ever of all time, I think the best Jesus film is actually The Miracle Maker which is a stop motion animation Jesus film. And in that, during Jesus's parables or during flashbacks, it cuts to this 2D animation style. And the illustrations in this very much remind me of the 2D animation clips from The Miracle Maker. If you haven't seen The Miracle Maker, man, it's, it's on YouTube, go watch it. It is the best Jesus movie like better than the passion, better than any of the, I, I like it better than the chosen. I just think it's phenomenal. Go check it out. I'd be interested to see what others think, but this style of illustration very much reminds me of the miracle maker. Now this is a storybook. It's not the Bible. It's not a study Bible. It's a storybook. So it's retelling the stories of the Bible in a way to get younger readers interested so that they'll then go and actually read the text themselves, or at least so they have an orientation orientation to those texts as they grow older and start to encounter them in scripture. And at times that means that Wright has to add some details to the text because readers may not know what's going on. So he gives some background, like in the story of Balaam and the donkey, it talks about Balaam being a prophet. And there's this parenthetical note. It says a prophet is someone who hears messages from God. God gives the prophet a message to pass on to everyone who will listen. So that's obviously that's not written in the Balaam story, but that's a great piece of background information that not only helps the story make more sense, but that helps the young reader understand this concept of prophet that's going to appear throughout scripture. Now, other times he'll add things that aren't in the text that are a bit more questionable. Like this one, for instance, when the donkey talks back to Balaam, he says, Balaam couldn't believe his ears. He thought he must be going mad, which is, of course, what you or I would think if our donkey started talking to us. But interestingly, in the Balaam story, in the book of Numbers, Balaam does not act remotely surprised. Balaam just carries on conversation as if he's talked to this donkey on many other occasions. So that's a little flourish that, you know, N.T. Wright added this in to make the story a little more vivid and more fun for younger readers, which may or may not have actually been true. But it's not like it's an unbiblical concept. It's just a little, you know, a little extra artistic license that's taken at times, but not very much. Throughout this, he sticks pretty close to the biblical text and doesn't get into a lot of the, the storybook elements that you'll see in some children's adaptations. Now, some of the passages aren't stories from the Bible. They're passages from the Bible, like Psalm 23. He has a whole section on Psalm 23 during the life of David. And this is where you get to see Wright's artistry, his poetry a little bit, because he redoes Psalm 23 as an English poem. So here's what he says. It says, when David was a boy, he used to make up songs while he was looking after the sheep. This song gives thanks for God's care and guidance. So here's how he renders Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd. There's nothing more I need. He takes me to the green, green fields to rest a while and feed. He lets me drink from cool, clear streams, making me feel like new. He leads me on a proper path since to his name he's true. Yes, even if we have to go through a dark and deadly way, I'll never be afraid because he's with me every day. I see his stick and staff and know he'll keep me safe from danger. He lays the table for a feast in sight of foe or stranger. He pours fresh oil upon my head. My cup is filled to the top. His goodness and his mercy follow me and never stop. So evermore in Yahweh's house, I now will make my home. And there I'll dwell in perfect safety through all the years to come. This is just a really nice way to present this to a 
audience of kids. Now, what do you do in a children's storybook when it comes to the non-kid friendly parts of the Bible? Well, Wright doesn't leave them out. I mean, obviously some of them he does, but for instance, David's adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah. He doesn't get into things that would make parents uncomfortable to read to their small children, but he also doesn't really sidestep it very much. He just kind of presents it and then it would be up to the parent or whoever's reading this to elaborate at whatever level of detail they think their child could understand. So when it comes to the incident with Bathsheba, it says that evening, David went up onto the flat roof of his palace. As he looked down on the houses below, he saw a woman bathing. She was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of the soldiers who was fighting in the army. Bathsheba was beautiful. David couldn't stop thinking about her. So he sent some servants to bring Bathsheba to the palace. Later, he sent her back home. Some weeks later, Bathsheba discovered she was going to have a baby. She sent a message to tell David that the baby was his. When he heard that, David ordered Bathsheba's husband back from battle and tried to persuade him to go see his wife. But Uriah refused to go home when other soldiers were still fighting. So David told the army commander to send Uriah back to the battle and put him in the front row of the fighting. That would surely mean Uriah would be killed. And that's what happened. Uriah died in battle, which meant that David could now take Bathsheba to be his wife. So it doesn't get into the tawdry details of the text. Uh, kids reading this might have questions of, well, how did she get pregnant? What does it mean he took her to the palace? It leaves room for parental discretion. And I think that's nice. And then Wright also includes some passages that you're not going to find in children's storybook adaptations because they're so strange or they're theologically uh, more rich than what most publishers think kids could probably handle. Like he gives Daniel five through seven, Daniel's vision of the monsters coming up out of the sea and the one like a son of man judging them. You know, that's like dense material with major eschatological implications. And so Wright explains that in a very easy to understand way. After the incident where Daniel is thrown into the lion's den and then he survives, at the end, there's this paragraph, and this would not have been included in most, in pretty much any other adaptation of Daniel for kids that I've ever seen, but I love this. It says, Daniel was a great prophet, and God sent him many visions. In one vision, Daniel saw four horrible monsters coming up out of the sea, shouting terrible threats. But then Daniel saw a great king sitting on a throne in heaven. This heavenly king was called the Ancient of Days. Next, a human being came up to the king and sat beside him. The human being was called a son of man. The monsters were condemned to death and the Son of Man became king of the whole world. The vision was about Jesus. And so you have this in the Old Testament, this title that Jesus is going to very specifically adopt for himself and, and kind of set his ministry around. You have right laying the seeds for that so that young readers, as they're growing up, learning about the Bible, it kind of sticks in their mind. Hey, this son of man character. Oh, that's the one who was like a human that overcame the monsters that shared the throne of God and, and that everybody worships. You know, it puts in place the context needed to make sense of these rich and deep theological passages that are going to come throughout scripture, drawing on this concept of the son of man. So I thought this was just a fantastic fantastic way of doing that. Another famous emphasis that N.T. Wright is known for, if you read his book, Surprised by Hope, he's trying to reclaim the biblical vision of resurrection and new creation. That it's not about, well, you die and your soul goes off to be with God in heaven forever. And that's the end. No, that's a platonic Greco-Roman pagan concept that's sort of kind of weaseled its way into Christian theology. But biblically speaking, the goal has always been resurrection, new creation, embodied existence. And so even in the Old Testament passages, Wright grabs those that speak of this, like Isaiah, Isaiah 11, 35, 55, 65. He sort of summarizes those passages, which speak of this new creation and lets them know this is what the Old Testament is pointing to all along. This is the goal, not dying and going off and going to heaven forever, but renewed paradise on earth where heaven and earth are joined together and death and sin and everything that marred creation has been done away with. And so he summarizes, God's people would return to their own land. They would live in peace. In fact, God would make a new heaven and a new earth. Yahweh's glorious presence would fill this newborn world like the water filling the sea. Everybody all over the world would be invited to a great feast 
Just as it was in the beginning when the world began, God would speak, and at his word, it would be done. A great way of tying up the Eden versus new creation bookends that scripture begins and ends with, and letting readers know this wasn't a New Testament concept. This is all the way back in the prophets in the Old Testament. Another interesting feature, right, is somewhat known for this is in his New Testament, he doesn't capitalize the word Satan. He doesn't think Satan is a proper name. He thinks that the Satan, ha Satan, the adversary or the tempter is a title, not a name. So when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, he's not tempted by Satan. He's tempted by the tempter. That's how he's rendering the word Satan. And Garcia's illustration doesn't even depict the tempter, unless it's possibly this little lizard, but I don't think it is. It's just the temptations that are being depicted. So you don't, this doesn't lend itself to the caricature of the guy in red with, you know, the pointy tail and the pitchfork and goat's feet and horns and all of that stuff, none of which is in the Bible. So I like this. I actually think that's a good choice. It keeps Satan from being identified with this buffoonish, cartoonish character. And Wright does a great job explaining when background material is necessary, he does a great job explaining it in a way that the reader can understand. So like when Jesus chooses his 12 disciples, there's a note here and it says a disciple is someone who devotes their life to understanding what their leader is saying and doing. They try to follow the leader's example in every way. That's a great definition of discipleship. I love that. And then he says, there's a reason why Jesus chose 12 disciples and not 11 or 13. Long ago, when the people of Israel became a nation, they were grouped into 12 tribes. But years later, the people were attacked by foreign armies and taken into exile. Later still, some of the people returned to their homeland, but the 12 tribes had never come back together as a whole nation. So when Jesus chose 12 disciples, he was showing people that God was bringing Israel together in a new way. In God's new world, he said, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones and rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, a theological, uh, hermeneutical insight that doesn't always get mentioned in children's Bible retellings, but that is incredibly important to see and understand the, the whole mission that Jesus was on. And he also does that with some of the parables that Jesus tells, like the parable of the sower. It begins, Jesus wanted to explain to people how God's kingdom was at last arriving. Long ago, the prophets had promised that one day there would be a new sort of harvest. God would sow new seed and God's people would grow strong and healthy again with new faith. So Jesus told the people this story. And then he tells them the parable of the four soils. So that's something that can completely get missed. Somebody might think, well, Jesus is just making up a story uh, using imagery that he sees in the world around him. And yeah, there's some truth to that, but it's easy to miss the intertextual links that readers steeped in the Old Testament would have intuitively picked up on. And so Wright brings those out in a number of the parables. And they even explains the nature of Jesus as telling the parables. It said, Jesus looked at the puzzled faces of the people around him. He was teasing them, getting them to think about what the story meant. If you've got ears, he said, then listen carefully. So this is letting the reader know, hey, it's okay if the parable doesn't make sense to you. It's supposed to be puzzled over. It, it, it is almost like a teasing, not in the sense of like holding something and snatching it away teasing, but like how we say teasing out something. Like the parables are intended to get you to think and rethink and rethink and mull them over and to consider them. That's what Jesus meant when he said, let them with ears listen. So again, a great way of explaining that to a young reader. Now, one incident did puzzle me a little bit, and it's when he retells the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. He says, it was Passover time when Jesus reached the temple courtyards. He saw lots of people who had traveled there for the festival. Many people wanted to buy animals to make sacrifices, but you could only use the special temple coins. Jesus could see that the traders who were changing the money and those who were selling the animals were charging far too much. That made Jesus angry. So he drove the traders and the animals out of the courtyard. He tipped over the traders' tables and the coins scattered everywhere, clattering over the cobblestones. Take these things away, he told the traders. You're turning my father's house into a market. Now, the only reason this stuck out to me is because in Wright's earlier work, the New Testament for Everyone series, this is Matthew volume two, he talks about this specific incident. And when he writes about the driving out of the money changers, he says, Jesus wasn't trying to take over the temple by force, as some people have thought, nor was he making a protest about exploitation by the money changers and the dove sellers. 
They may well have been making a profit. They, after all, had to make a living as well as everybody else. And he points out why that they had to sell the animals there because they would get damaged along the way if people were coming all the way from Galilee or somewhere else to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so he says it isn't the buying, selling and money changing he's objecting to in itself, but rather that they had made it into a brigands lair or a, a, what's translated as den of thieves. But it's this word brigand that means like insurrectionist or violent rebel or something like that, that they that in, in Matthew for everyone, right? says that Jesus was primarily angry because they had turned the temple into like this revolutionary base and used the one place in the temple where Gentiles were allowed to come and pray to God. They used that for selling and thereby kept people of the nations from coming to God. So that's the approach he took in Matthew for everyone. I don't know if he changed. I mean, it looks like he changed his view since then, but he was the one who always, at least from what I saw, said, no, it wasn't that they were selling and charging more in the temple that made Jesus angry. It was what they were doing and why they were doing it. So it was odd to see him here say, oh, well, it was just because they were charging a lot more because there's no evidence of that in the text at all. So this, I would, I'd be interested uh, in, in T. Wright. I don't know if you're ever going to see this, but if you do, I'd be interested to know if you've changed your view on this passage or not. But it's not a huge issue. In fact, of the entire storybook, this was the only passage that I read that I even wrote a note down like, hey, wait a minute. I don't know if I agree with that or not. Everything else pretty much I thought was fantastic. And then in the end, after he finishes with Acts, there's like one page summaries of certain books of the Bible. So here's Hebrews. And this is sort of a one page summary of the message of Hebrews, how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these Hebrew Bible concepts. And then there's a one page overview of James and a one page overview of first Peter and a page overview of first John. Now it would have been cool if he had done all of the new Testament letters that way. He doesn't do them all. But again, most children's storybook adaptations don't even touch those passages. And then we come to revelation. Uh, he just picks a few sections of revelation, you know, Revelation 1, the vision of Jesus. And there he's walking among the seven lampstands with the seven stars, hair white as wool, long white robe. Doesn't have the sword coming out of his mouth, but, but you know, you can't draw everything. And then Revelation 4 and 5, the vision of the throne room and the four living creatures covered in eyes and the elders around the throne and the seven lampstands. And then the end of Revelation 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem and the river of life and the trees with fruit and leaves for the healing of the nations, new creation once again. And then it ends with John 1, with the prologue of John's gospel, in the beginning was the word. So it bookends the creation account in Genesis with the prologue of John's gospel, where Jesus, the word, is the one who creates all things. And then after that, there are some maps and these just give the general location of some of the stories. And then an index. And this is mostly an index of names or topics that are dealt with throughout the text. And that's it. So that's the Big Picture Bible Storybook by N.T. Wright, illustrated by Helena Perez Garcia. Uh, pros and cons. I'll start with the cons. I think it was too short, honestly. I think 140 stories, I wish that there were about 200 stories or more. There are passages that didn't get included. There are stories that didn't get included. And this is, you know, this is a pretty substantial book, but I just would like to have seen more. I wish he would have taken on more of scripture. He's a busy man. I get it. And for what this is, it's fantastic. So that's kind of my only complaint, really. I love the illustrations. I love how green everything is like how vivid and colorful and oriented to creation. There's, there's a lot of, you can tell that there's a love for the earth, for creation. And, and that's rooted in Wright's theology of stewardship and trying to live out now the reality of the new heavens and the new earth and be God's steward of this creation. So the fact that it's green and naturey and the artwork is iconographic, but it's not tied to one particular culture or ethnicity. I love all of that. And honestly, I think churches that have children's ministries or, or Sunday school classes for, let's say, through maybe second grade, this should be the curriculum. Honestly, I think one of these should be in every classroom and, and the teacher could literally just read a story that week, show the illustrations. The kids could talk about it. They could do their crafts. They could, you know, make their little Noah's arcs or whatever that you want to do. But 
the the theology and the overall narrative that Wright is putting in place is the thing that I have to teach those kids' parents and grandparents because they never learned it as children. So seeing this taught at the earliest ages would make my job as a teacher of adults so much easier in the future. So if you're a pastor, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a homeschool curriculum chooser, whatever, if you work with kids, I think this resource should be introduced into your curriculum. I think you should take kids through this 140 stories, you know, divide it up. That's like in in one a week in about three years or so, you could get through the whole thing. And the kids would have a Genesis to Revelation understanding of the Bible's big picture. So those are my thoughts. I would love to hear yours. If you've read the Big Picture Bible storybook by N.T. Wright, tell me what you think. If you know of other great resources out there for children that are also done by people people with solid theological background and education. I'd love to hear about those as well. If you're looking for some of the children's resources out there that we've reviewed here on the channel, I'll link the playlist in the video description below to where I've reviewed different children's storybook Bibles or study Bibles. Take a look at those. And as always, if you found this review helpful, if you appreciate this channel, we would really love it. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button. And when you do, enable notifications. That just can't tell you how much that helps this channel grow. That's all for now. Stay tuned for more here at Disciple Dojo. And as always, keep training.